So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, for this panel, Reaching Beyond the Impact of Israeli Art. Uh, my name is Noam Segal. I'm an Israeli curator. And here with me are Dolin Remen, the co-founder of Public Art Fund, um, Michal Rovner, an Israeli artist based in Israel and New York, and Neil Hod, an Israeli artist based in New York. So we're going to start with... Uh, we're going to start with Neil's presentation. So, welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank Shalom. You. And, um, Thank you. So, it's a little bit hard to speak about like so many works in like short time, but I will try to make it in the right way. So we start. We choose to start with this body of work called Mother. It's a, it's a show that I had in New York uh, three and a half years ago, and it was uh, eleven paintings. Um, it was repetition of like uh, this painting. I, I made it in like nine different colors, and uh, one big painting. And the idea of the show, this is how it looks part of them. It was based on some like iconic painters and artworks from like the shadow painting of Andy Warhol to uh, Velasquez to El Greco. And the idea was to take, and my work deal a lot with icons. I like to take icons and, and like change them or do some kind of a twist and bring it back to the culture or society as something new. For me, this is some kind of upgrade or this is some kind of correction and for me it's also in very childish way almost to change the rules and to think in a very different way and to start to see things in a different way. And I built this installation in that way, very much like film noir and this reputation. And I really like the idea when people walk and it says mother, that everybody argue, most of the people argue. By the way, Rivka is here and she brought like a group of collectors and some of them one of the only things they talk about is the bag, if it's Prada, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, and I really like it because that's the idea. And the installation went to that way, uh, and then there was a big one. And if you can see on the wall, on the right wall, there was a small image. And when people went to see this image, all of the sudden, the sudden, the whole show looks completely different, I'm sorry. It was this one. And it's based on this iconic photo called The Boy from Warsaw Ghetto. And as an Israeli living in New York, I think like really far from like my roots, from my family, from like my mom even, I started to look at like things, not just out in general, in a very emotional, sentimental, even like very different way. Because just from the far sometimes, we really understand or we can really like look at ourselves in like realistic way. So I choose to take these women that one time Actually, by mistake, I noticed her because I worked on a completely different body of work. And I was obsessed with like, the images of children from like Cinema Paradiso, Life is Beautiful, Run Boy Run, to like different genre. And one day in New York, in the winter, I look at this photo just to see the expression of this child. And I noticed this woman next to him. I mean, this, like, we grew up on this picture, on this image. And I looked at her as such a like modern woman, modern with the bag, and she's got bracelets and ring and the hair and everything. And the only thing I did was painted her in in colors. And I think that it just like give her the almost like the respect. And I call her mother because I think like this is the dream of every woman. And by that it became something even more tragic, like larger than life. And I like all the connotations, especially in a place like New York, because for me it was quite like new to show it like in New York compared to like Israel, for example, where people talk a lot about women looking for a taxi. There was a lot of people who talk about like it looks like this image, like fashion advertising of a woman go out of Barney's or Belt of Goodman looking for a taxi. And I really like it. And a lot of people said to me after that, oh, I feel so, I have like guilty that I, f that I thought that way. And I said, no, this is the idea. I mean, this is some kind of like, when you take it out of a context and you build it in, in a new context, I mean, this is what it is. And I think it shows also something like from our culture, something from our history, something very iconic. We start to see it in a different way. And also this relation that I like to work with it a lot. My work is so much about paradox and conflict that can come together as an artwork. 
and my works like deal with this. And so for me, the idea between life and death, like there is some kind of like, if you can see on the bag in the original photo, after that I noticed, like there is almost like a face of, it, of a child, like from the wrinkle of the sun. In her, in her hair, there is like almost like a flat skull. So all this kind of like uh, subject matter that I'm working from, like beauty and destruction, like like the to fall in love with something we're not supposed to, like the forbidden. It I found it very interesting, and I was like, and very powerful. So this is one of the body of works called Mother. Uh, two years ago. In Art Basel, I had like this piece. It's called Once Everything Was Much Better, Even the Future. And grew up in Israel, the only thing that I had the connection to this like oil pump was I remember that I used to watch with my mom like the show uh, Dallas. And this was the opening. And I really like it. And then like I remember that one time I at some point I walked like it was the last minute that I worked on like soldiers and like Israel, very Israeli subject. And I was in New York and there was in a document at CNN about like oil in the world and all this conflict between America and Iran and the Middle East and Israel. And all the time I used to, like it stuck in my mind this image of like this oil pump. And coming from the Middle East, like the oil and like as a child or teenager, it was such a like, strong, important sub subject. So at one point, my wife, she, she's Dutch. I'm telling you all these stories just so you can see how the brain is working. My wife, she's Dutch, and I went to, to uh, Holland for her. She converted, but her family, you know, they're so obsessed with Christmas. And I, 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 I had a snow globe in, in my hand, and I said, it's so beautiful, you know, this kind of like, object and like this kind of culture. And the minute I hold it, I said, you know, this will be so interesting to, pull, to put like this oil pump inside. By the way, it's very big. It weighed like half a ton. It's 480. <laughs> no, just because it's not like it's very, very big piece. And it's all working inside. And to call it once everything was much better, even the future, again, it's to combine something so powerful and something so kind of problematic. At the same time, something so kind of rich and loaded. And, again, and to call it once, everything was much better, because I think that it's another some kind of conflict. But I try to bring my art in something always in this kind of like the surface is very seductive, is really beautiful. It's almost like there is this element of seduction. But if you read it in the right way, there's like very dark and like very kind of deep meanings from the intellect to emotional. So it's always, again, some kind of conflict that comes together because I like to show the beauty and sadness or the sadness in beauty. And once they live together, I mean, this is a great artwork, not, not for me, like in, re in general. And this was another piece. I mean, I was so influenced, like living in New York with all this luxury and beauty, but at the same time, the Arab Spring started and like all this like violence and stuff in Israel. And I like when something weak became powerful or something powerful became weak. And this relation between like the flowers and the flame, it's a big paintings. And with all this like a connotation from history, even like from the Bible, from the bush, uh, the burning bush, to like this is our life, this is our dream, this is our soul. And I created these like three paintings called I want always to be, to be remembered in your heart. So I like this kind of like impact that it's like, as we call it, it's in your face, like these kind of images. But then once you start to understand where it comes from, it takes you to completely different places in your mind or in like life. This, uh, all these scratches paintings, when I worked on Mother, one day I, I saw an image on the internet because I Google like a lot of things from like the Holocaust. And I found like these scratches on the wall and I said, this is so rock and roll, it's so punk, it looks like so fashion. And I had it on my computer for like a an year and a half and from time to time I went back. And one day I, I read where it comes from and I didn't understand that this has come from Auschwitz gas chamber. So I developed this technique to chrome canvases, like all the white part, if you're standing in front of it, there are really big chrome canvases, you can see yourself. And the idea was to show this light coming from the dark, or the crack that can bring so much light through it. And I like this relation between history and like modern world. 
till that point that we don't even like know what is right and what is wrong and sometimes it's this like beautiful twilight zone as an artist or as people and this was the, la the last piece that happened by mistake kind of mistake you know I start to understand that there's no mistake and there was a I had an interview and the writer said there's no mistake only God great perfection so this was a canvas that I put on this like for the all summer on the roof of my uh, studio and it became gold and then it started to crack and there was also something like almost like an iconic like from the Pope or some religious figure inside the canvas. I call it like the most problematic place in the world reference to Jerusalem. This is part of the scratches paintings and I like again when people saw it it says oh it's so rock and roll it's so punk it looks like some kind of bathroom of CBGB to like like London and all this boutique hotel that they have this look but I start to understand that there is parallel world with the same look, and this is something very interesting. And this is where I took, this is some of the new works that I'm doing. So I start to chrome canvases, and under there is uh, a painting. So all the gradation painting that you see, it's an oil paint, then I chrome the oil canvas, and with very strong air pressure gun, I break like everything that it's uh, melted into the canvas, and again, People really like it. It has to do a lot with the selfie and narcissism at the same time like darkness and decay. And this is how it looks when you're standing in front. And again, it comes from this. As a Jewish or as a person, I always feel attracted to something very dark and to, to show like the beauty in it and to bring it back as something very, almost like beautiful, seductive object. And I like this double meaning. And when I saw this, and then I start to collect, I found like this something, it's so emotional, and it's so kind of like almost asking to touch it again, and to do some, for me, it's some kind of correction. As Israeli, as Jewish, and as a person. I always, I guess like this is where I come from, and this is where I'm going, and this is where I want to take other people with my art uh, with me. And it's called, by the way, it's called, Nothing is more narcotic than the past. So titles are very, very important for me, and they always have some connotation to the past, but with some kind of a twist to the future. Thank you, Neil. That was very inspiring and moving. I just want to add that Neil's work, uh, which Neil actually works in various medias, including also video, sculpture, and painting. And his works were shown in Paul Kasmin Gallery in New York, in Jake Scheinman Gallery in New York, and at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in Israel. So thank you for this. Thank you. And, uh, now and to another, uh, sorry. Yeah. Another? No, no. Oh, so if, I think maybe we'll keep the questions for later yeah, for yeah. all of us. Um, now we'll move to another prolific Israeli artist, Michal Rovner. Uh, Michal has pioneered the use of moving image as a non-narrative medium for the creation of powerful visual installations. Her work evokes human interaction, dislocation, and persistence of history, stripping the narrative to its barest, most urgent elements. Her work creates a new level of immediacy. Uh, Rovner's work in sculpture, video, drawing, sound, and installation is included in the collections of leading museums worldwide, uh, including uh, her mid-career retrospective at the Whitney Museum in New York, uh, the Venice Biennial, um, Michal represented Israel, the Israel Pavilion, at the Louvre in Paris, and Jeux de Pomme in Paris as well. So without further ado, Michal, maybe you can start. Um, thank you. Walking like that, yeah. Uh, one question: If if I want to to do a freeze or something for a moment, I'll do it. Okay. Um, so I I um, I'm going to and could we turn off the lights when uh, when uh, I show the who is doing that? Yeah, th there is a way to turn the lights off then. In a minute. Yeah, just press it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Thank you. Not quite now, but you know, like <laughs> so. So, um, nice to meet you all, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I always uh, start with reality. I always collect or record something from reality. 
some people look at my work and you know they know these people you know it's the artist who has all these people and but it's never animation it's always real people that I film in real places and very often that there are people from different places that are meeting in this new context of, of the work so you know I, I, I start with the reality but I like really I have an, an, an urge to immediately erase a lot of details a lot of details which uh, has to do with the, you know, identifying details. And I like to take something out of a place, out of a context, and to really plant it in another context. And by erasing all the details and my, by placing it in another context, uh, it can be then any person, anywhere. It's not out of the urge to get away from reality. I, I rather feel that, um, I also, by the way, have an attention deficit problem. So <laughs> when there's a ch which I tend to do when I sit there, kind of holds me back. And everybody's ready. OK, so um, it, it's not trying to get away from reality. I feel that all, all my work is, a, is a, a way of interacting with reality, trying to assess it, trying to to map something about reality, really, that I, I'm still trying to figure out or, or uh, I'm questioning myself uh, and so we can start by by that and um, can we turn the light off and so I, I'm gonna show you a few works I will say a few things uh, and there is sound also or can there will be A little bit, okay. So here you see how I, it's, it's a, an evidence that I'm really f starting with reality. I'm standing with a group of people. I'm giving them very schematic instructions. This walk, uh, okay, is, maybe we'll start in a minute again, okay, because the, we are too consumed by, by uh, problems here. Okay, no light, everything is working. Just no like light. this. <laughs> this is a good show by itself, you know, I love it. You actually should look back, it's, it's more interesting than the video, you know, the people are freaking up with you, know. By the way, I have a reputation of a very technological artist, you know, these people are walking in petri dishes on buildings and, you know, I never know how to even turn any button on and off. <laughs> Often when I give, give a talk and, you know, it's, it's not because of you, it's my karma <laughs> that something stops, you know, or breaks. And um, so this is, this is the work I did to represent <laughs> Israel in Venice Biennale. I, I actually um, called it data zone, you know, the data, data information zone. And, um, and there were white tables and on them were uh, generic petri dishes, culture dishes. So there were kind of cultures about cultures, you know, the, the, there is, all these people walking there, you'll see patterns and um, uh, automaticities that have to do with us as humans. And mostly, um, I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> but uh, there, is, there is this re great reputation of, of Israel as a computer, uh, yeah. you know. We'll get it in a second. I, I can talk on and on. It happened to me in Weizmann Institute. I had a 17 minutes exactly presentation. Everything was by the moment. And then I got so excited. Whatever happened, happened, it stops. <laughs> so I said to them, you know, that uh, in science, it's, um, people say that the, the most important thing in science is to ask the right question. I was not going to have time for questions, but now we have time for questions. <laughs> they were sure it was a performance, you know. <laughs> what happened, it was a performance, but involuntarily, because what happened is that I actually stepped on the cable of the, <laughs> and I, I pulled the electricity off. So all these j scientists, you know, and all my uh, team was trying to figure out the computer, but while it was just maybe <laughs> happened the same story here. But usually I'm a very serious person. I take things very seriously. So I'll go back to that, you know. Uh, um, how, how are you there? <laughs> what happened? 
No sound, I can howl. Okay, so we will get it. There is some works that are very oh, dependent on the sound. Here? Now we have mm. sound. We're supposed to have. Mm. Okay, look, so these are cultures about cultures. Uh, in one minute, if we don't get the sound, I'm going to insist on it because it's very important for me, the sound. No sound? Okay, so let's stop. Oh, here. Can you raise it? Okay. Can you freeze it for a moment? Thank God. Okay. Can you go back a bit? Are you, are you able to go back a bit? A bit? Can you give, will you give me another chance to make a good impression? Okay. Like to hear? Okay. Right. Okay, so what I actually wanted to do in Venice, what I wanted to do in this whole story of cultures about cultures is actually to give the viewer a viewpoint of a scientist. So you know, when you walk in, as, as someone walks into an exhibition and you have tables that have generic, real, actually absolutely real petri, petri dishes, which are the better name for me for this context is culture dishes. You could even lift the glass cover and you look at them. You, you really find yourself, you know, and looking down and trying to research something. And, and like in art, I think art's best role is to, you know, to give you another viewpoint of something, but mostly to, to present a question to you. And so people ask me many questions about this and where did you film it and, you know, what camera and what did it. But the question that kept repeating often and often, which really satisfied me a lot and and it's really in the base of of my work practice i would say was it so tell me is it us or is it them so we can continue mm -hmm. uh, And so, you know, about, about order, disorder. And then I went, I told you that I like, can you turn the volume down a bit? Okay, so I often like to mix footage from different places. I filmed 50 people in the age of 50 in Russia, 50 people in the age of 50 in Israel, and 50 people in the age of 50 in Romania. Can you turn the light off? I'm not going to ask anything from the technicians. Yes, that's it, thanks. So I actually wanted to create, I wanted to create a, a, a total environment in a, in a room, like a wallpaper, like a, like a moving, actually a moving text. I reduced those rows of people, 50 from different places to, to those rows, that, you know, summing up to about 30,000 figures walking endlessly without a beginning, without an end, some kind of what I call an unresolved text about humanity. And it's the first time that I, um, I use the word text because I could have made them very large, but I wanted to reduce them to something that the word text came out of my, my mouth. And then I went on into making these kind of works, which really are very text-related works. I, and there are projections in vitrines that look like the vitrines of the Israel Museum. There are projections on stones and sometimes on notebooks. And the text is, is not, has no meaning. You know, like the, there is a text, but there is an era erasure of a meaning only there is something about the urge to communicate and my urge to stretch the timeline to the beginning of writing, beginning of text, beginning of art, which was on, on a stone, and that urge that someone at a far point in time had to leave a mark on a stone and to send a communication to an unknown future. I feel this is maybe what is in common to all of us artists and many people is, 
you know, facing the temporality of life, that you want to carve something in, in life, you know, to leave a mark. Uh, and uh, a lot of my work deals with uh, the cracks that occur in the history, occur over time, kind of collisions and the attempt to Uh, and uh, this has to do with the pro this is an ongoing project called Macom. Macom means place. Why can't we turn the light off? Maybe try another button. Ah, hide the sensor. So, uh, okay, so it started with collecting stones of, sorry, sorry, it started with collecting stones of ruined, destroyed, dismantled Israeli and Palestinian houses. And even though they were in different sizes, as you can see in the film, uh, ah, it doesn't work with it, no pill, pill, it doesn't work. Okay, so I, I gather a team of Israeli and Palestinian stone masons, and together we tried to connect the stones together. Uh, it took almost a year to put all the stones together without changing or cutting or breaking them. Uh, we seem to have problems there, yes? Okay, so the result is a collage of about 60 tons of stones. It looks like a very coherent collage of times, places, biographies. And then while we do that, th then I, I, had, I knew I will have a show in a, in a very important place for me and I made, kept making those. And this is, the, at this time I agreed to break or to cut the stone. These are stones from the border between Israel and Syria. Uh, a few years before the problems in Syria began. And I wanted to express the, the, the feeling of a tear, of a break. Uh, also that has to do with the history of our place and while we walk uh, like that, and I gather the team of Israeli and Palestinian stone maces. So you can see in this picture, the guy on the left is from uh, Galil, Galilee, and you know, and the guy from the right is Israeli born in Egypt, and then there is with the brown shirt is from Ramallah, and the one, you will see another one is from Hebron and Bethlehem, and all of us, and um, walking together and mending together with the stones, and this is in my place in Israel, and after we make it, I, I wanted to have this collage of times, places, biographies, a kind of summarizing of destruction and creation and destruction. Uh, I wanted to shift it to another place. So we take it apart uh, and we kind of ruin it in order to bring it to another place. Five weeks in the sea, the team of Israelis and Palestinians come to, to Paris, to Napoleon Square next to the Louvre. And we, uh, we together, hand by hand, very intimate, very closely, uh, you know, rebuild these structures. And there's a dialogue here, you know, between the pyramid and the glass pyramid and the stone pyramid. And also uh, a dialogue between one architecture and another architecture. But mostly to me, uh, you know, these pieces of history arrive to this place and they start to have a dialogue with the pieces of history that are living in the, in the Louvre Museum because, you know, it is really a box of treasures of all the footnotes of humanity. This is Mesopotamia and that's on the way to the Egyptian art and on the way to the Egyptian art there is this passage which is uh, actually the only authentic stones, it's from Louis the Thirteenth or whatever. It's a stone wall and on a scale of uh, 13 meters by like 40 meters, 40 feet long whatever by whatever. I made this projection of females that look like, you know, kind of mourners, you know, that are mourning, that, 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 that trying to mend something and heal and concerned again about humanity. And, and here is this other work. And if you see that the, the show is entitled, his, titled History, Histories, you might think it's the Pyramid or the Colosseum and some kind of historical site. But actually, if you look at the caption, it says, restoration of the Louvre and I, I um, filmed, this is the glass pyramid and the Louvre itself, I filmed the people and I said to myself, if in the future Paris will feel so safe, 
will break in some way, or the Louvre, I hope not, but me, the future imaginary architect or artist, I'm already preparing to give a proposal for the restoration of this place. So, you know, by projecting the present on the past and thinking about the future is, is um, you know, something I really like to, to do and mix. And the people that you see in this work, they were just the visitors who went to the Louvre, and we will see them later in Napoli. I have to close my speech, my great speech. <laughs> uh, no problem. What? Up to you. Uh, maybe just a few more, more of these, and um, and so these are, these are again the Cyprus from Jerusalem, together with hillside of Samaria, uh, you know, and these kind of landscapes that I made later on, dropping the Cyprus and the sites, and they are landscape of dislocation, kind of uh, abstracted. Uh, disarrayed uh, landscape of people who are sort of stuck in time, in place. Uh, it really refers to the enormous n numbers of, of uh, migration dislocations that is going on in the world right now, was going on in the world a year ago when I made this exhibition. It's people who are really, uh, maybe like those figures in my work, looking for a place looking for a new place, looking for identity, uh, facing the erasure of a, a place and facing the erasure of identity and um, going in kind of endless trails. Uh, but it also looks like a drawing. And uh, maybe because I'm greedy, I will show you one image of the exhibition that I have right now going on in New York at the Pace Gallery in Chelsea, if you get the time and a chance. This is six meters high, and I almost dropped the people, and these are, you know, animals, almost all the show. I was filming in the fields, it's wild jackals. They are there, the next step after whatever, wherever we are going, I guess they were there and they will stay. Thank you, Michal, very much for this. <laughs> Mesmerizing. Um, so hold on to your questions, because we have more presentations to go. Uh, I want to introduce Doreen Remen. Uh, Doreen graduated on 89 from Rhode Island School of Design with a Bachelor degree of Fine Arts and Architecture. She went on to earn her master's degree in architecture from Columbia University in 91. She worked with a selection of architecture firms in New York before co-founding Art Production Fund in 2000, uh, a nonprofit organization dedicated to commissioning and producing innovative and accessible public art around the world. In 2013, along with Yvonne Forrest Villarreal, Remen created Culture Corps, an advisory firm that provides curatorial programming and art consultation to select clientele. In 2014, Remen launched Art Market, a production distribution and licensing company for artist designed merchandise as a way to support artists in the retail sphere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to bring all that. Um, first of all, thank you both, um, Nir and Michal. It's like such an honor to be here with these artists who have, are groundbreaking and phenomenal. And Noam, thank you. It's really, truly uh, thrilling and exciting. Thank you, Rivka, and everybody here. It's very exciting to be speaking to you about art. So um, I uh, co-founded in 2000 Art Production Fund. Art Production Fund is an organization dedicated to commissioning and producing ambitious public art projects, reaching new audiences, and expanding awareness through contemporary art. So I'm here really to talk to you about what is possible with artists in the public realm, and hopefully one day uh, bring projects by these great artists to the public, uh, very much like, um, like Michal just showed us at the Louvre. Where else can we do that and, and to support the organizations um, and the institutions to do that? So, 
I'll show you a few of our projects. Basically, what we do is we commission artists, we invite them to do a, pro a project in the public, we help them find the location, help them get the funding and, um, and the production resources, help them install it, present it to the public, do the PR and, um, and then deinstall in most cases. We do all kinds of projects ranging from performances to installations, billboards, videos, anywhere around the world. Uh, we make sure that these, pu these projects are free to everybody and that they're also accessible. So they're in locations where you can happen upon them on your, on your commute to work, on your way to an errand. Uh, you don't necessarily have to take uh, time out to go see art. And that the projects that we work on are all very accessible conceptually also. So that, um, you know, that they can be enjoyed by a young child as well as an art historian. The reason that we do this is because art, art uh, brings beauty and creativity to our lives. It really elevates our consciousness, opens our minds, allows us to see other perspectives and, um, and, and messages uh, from the artists. Art uh, speaks, uh, communicates without and beyond language. It really speaks to our hearts and our minds and in this way is a way for every, to allow a platform for communicating and reaching um, other people. So I'll go through our greatest hits, so to speak, really quickly. Um, the one of the first projects we did was with artists, um, oops, okay, wait, oh, too much, okay, artist Rudolf Stingel. Rudolf Stingel is an artist, he's a conceptual artist who often works with carpeting in his work, and he, what, his idea w was to do a domestic gesture in the public space, uh, so he wanted to carpet Grand Central Station which we helped him do. This is Vanderbilt Hall, it's 27,000 square feet. It's industrial carpeting with an off-the-shelf design that was tweaked with Rudy's colors of, of neon, pink, and blue. And uh, this, this um, project took about six months to prepare and install, and it was up for six weeks. It was v so popular, people loved it. They came through, I think, 120,000 commuters daily. It was one of the easiest uh, public projects that everybody had to find and get to in Grand Central Station. People uh, loved the carpet. It was like a sound sculpture. Their commute to work was suddenly muffled and quiet. People ate lunch on it. They rolled around on it. And then there were people that hated it and came by and said, this isn't art, it's my grandmother's living room. But it didn't matter. It was, they were talking about something other than their day to day and they were communicating with each other. This project by uh, Elm Green and Drag Set um, is our only permanent work. These are phenomenal artists who create hyper-realistic installations uh, that startle us and jolt us out of our habitual thinking and make us start questioning our belief systems and our habits. They just uh, had a phenomenal re uh, show at the Tel Aviv Museum uh, that just came down in August. Uh, so in this particular case, they wanted to create a Prada store in the middle of the desert. Not actually a store, but more a monument, a kind of tongue-in-cheek monument to consumerism to allow us to start to notice how we commercialize and commodify everything, including nature. So we uh, created this, we helped them create this, this store, a bodego, on the highway between El Paso and Marfa, with hundreds of miles of nothing on one direction and hundreds of miles of nothing on the other direction. You're driving down the road and suddenly you see the glow of Prada. And you're actually so excited, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but. Um, this uh, project was not funded by Prada. That would have been a conflict of interest. However, Mucha Prada did give the bags and the shoes herself. The, bag, the 2005 collection of bags and shoes are in the store just to look at. You cannot open the door or go in. Uh, we got the logo from her, the design of the actual boutique, everything. The art world loved it instantly. The neighborhood hated it instantly. And within three days, it was broken into. The bags and the shoes were stolen. And dumb, dumb, D-U-M, D-U-M was spray painted on the side of the building. So we pulled ourselves together, uh, got the second pairs of shoes, and the, actually there was the left foot 
in uh, the first time, and now we put the right foot of the same pairs of shoes back in the bags and, uh, and put it back up. Now, ten, fast forward 10 years later, it's actually um, a museum status, which means that it can't be taken down and it can't be uh, touched w at all. It's a beloved um, a national landmark, actually. It's on the, one of the top, uh, CNN's top uh, 10 list of art destinations. And you can see on the top left, that's Beyonce, unsolicited, <laughs> who went and Instagrammed um, her, her trip to Parada Marfa. This project um, is a very, uh, came to us with, uh, by the artist Yvette Mattern, a global rainbow in New York City, 2012, after the hurricane, Sandy. This project was in existence. She had already uh, made it, and she wanted to give a gift to the city. This project cost us nothing. All we had to do was get a location to install it. These lasers travel 35 miles, and they could be seen from the downtown Standard Hotel all the way to the Far Rockaways, which were most affected by Sandy. And it really was a feel-good moment. It was a little bit of sugar that the city needed at that moment, and, and it was very well received and a, a real gift. Okay. Now, this project is our current project right now. It's with artist Ru Ugo Rodinone. Uh, we, um, this project took us five years to put together. We uh, collaborated with the Nevada Museum of Art. It's up right now for two years. We invited, Ugo, Ugo does projects often uh, dealing with nature and with, um, with kind of emotions that are common to everybody. And he, we invited him to consider the highway between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And this is what he came up with, conceptually and physically midway point between the artificial and the natural. These are actual limestone boulders. They're, they're stacked one on top of the uh, other, painted these colors. Uh, the, the stacks go up 35 feet each, about 30, 35 feet. It's really a modern day Stonehenge. And uh, from the moment that we uh, installed it, uh, people didn't stop coming. And now you, you know, the ton, tens and, and scores of people daily come see it. This was the ribbon cutting with the mayor. That's the artist, Ugo Rodanoni there. It was such a, uh, it was really a very um, significant moment in the, in the um, history of the city. And these are all the Instagram, um, hundreds of Instagrams. You can go to Seven Magic Mountains and follow it. And this is up for, supposed to be up uh, one more year and hopefully we'll get an extension and maybe be permanent. Now, we're able to work with some Israeli artists, happily, on some smaller projects. This is Tamari Toon, who, um, she's a sculptor and a, a performance artist and a dancer, and she creates a visual language that brings to life her sculptures. We presented, we helped her present this piece of hers that she had created in Bryant Park in New York City. It's a procession, and these dancers walked, uh, actually danced uh, around uh, moved around the park for about half an hour. Audiences came, they followed uh, this procession. People came from, you know, just happened across the project. It was such a, a very, very um, special happening in New York City. And this is the artist, Lior Grady. We, run, we ran a, a residency at the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas. Um, they gave us a studio, which was a glass storefront and a very uh, crowded floor, and they allowed us to do something with artists there. So we invited one artist every month, a different artist, to create a project and do an interactive project uh, with the audience so people could come in and engage with the artist and the work. So Lior's work is very poetic. Uh, he use um, poetry into uh, everyday items. He's very informed by his Yemenite roots and domesticity. He created a, uh, a wall of pillows and a stack of sheets that you know, reminded people that they were actually in a, a hotel and brought them back to this intimate moment. And then he stood there and ironed um, uh, these sheets and also small little handkerchiefs. And then you came in, after you experienced the installation, you came to him and you gave him a word, a word that came to your mind as you were experiencing this from whatever it was. And Lior uh, then 
embroidered that word into the little handkerchief. And you came back later and you got your little memento with this handkerchief with this special word. And the exchange for Lyra was he had this um, document of all these special words that uh, very intimate um, connection between strangers, essentially. Now the next step that we uh, have taken bringing art into the public is by producing pr uh, products. So th in our production fund we make many products that bring artist images to uh, the public at the price of accessories. So here are, these are collaborations, um, some of them that we've done with Barney's in New York, with the artist Alex Katz, with Roy Lichtenstein's estate, and also phenomenal artists ranging from Cindy Sherman to uh, Jeff Koons. And finally, um, these are products by Nier Hood, who um, also brings, um, is, makes his uh, amazing images available to the public, really at the price of accessories. So um, this is something that I'm trying to bring forward through Art Market in a big way, finding one platform where all products can be um, located, giving the artists a revenue stream outside of their artwork and also opening up the art world, uh, the world of art to uh, the mass audience. And all of this, just a tip of the iceberg of what's possible with and through art. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Um, so lastly, uh, I will show a small selection of uh, my work and then we can talk a little bit about other issues. Um, so as I said, my name is Noam. I'm an Israeli curator. I recently moved to uh, New York. And um, oh, permit? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I just want to see. Look at me. Is it the Okay, so um, um, so up until recently, I was also an adjunct professor at Bezalel Academy of Art and Design, which some of you heard about in the previous panel, and I'm also a PhD candidate in Bar Ilan University in Israel. So my first significant uh, role as a curator was I founded a space, a non-for-profit art space in the center of Tel Aviv called Rocha 69 which uh, initially was about allocating budgets for individual artists to produce a new body of works to showcase in Rocha 69, accompanied by uh, academic level uh, catalog and also an extensive uh, public programming. One of the uh, activities that we made was also the first uh, symposium in Israel held entirely in Arabic. And then the listeners enjoyed only constitutive translations Translation meaning that they had to hear the language as a sort of a melody and also then to encounter the, the meaning of the words. Uh, this is another project we did. It's actually a robotic performance. So what you see here is a DIY robot made by the artist Guy Baramot. Uh, they were sitting on a bar and the audience was sitting with them. This exhibition was announced by Haaretz uh, acclaimed newspaper as the best exhibition for 2011 in Israel. A guy is also a Bezalel graduate. Um, this is another project by uh, Ofri Knaani. Ofri is an Israeli artist. Oops. Uh, oh, I can't go back. Ofri uh, is based in New York, and this specific project was dealing with the Sota. It's a, it's a chapter in the Gemara which deals with the adulterous uh, women. So actually, as you can see, and I'll show later on also, dealing with various Jewish uh, subjects. So actually, being a curator means to a large extent uh, also working very closely with the artist. Yeah, and um, having a multiple studio visits and an extensive dialogue, uh, shaping together the artwork and also contextualize it in the right, fra in the right framing and find the right budgets for it and find the right location for it. So one way, uh, and of course, most importantly, bridging. Uh, the bridging thing is, has to do a lot with 
exporting, if I can say that, uh, Israeli artworks abroad and Israeli artists, but also bringing and inviting uh, international artists and curators to Israel in order to also to, to create and to expand uh, mutual discourse. Obviously, like Israel, like any other uh, nation, has its own very local discourse and uh, curatorial work today is uh, a lot about also create uh, uh, boundaries, uh, uh, creating bridges and not boundaries and creating a common realm to the Israeli art to coexist with the rest of the world. So, um, for instance, in this exhibition, Siander Actor, which was at the Petah Tikva Museum, we showed also, I showed also the work of Sharon Hayes. She's a very acclaimed New York artist. She had a solo also at the Whitney and uh, Liz Magic Laser next to Israeli artists like Boaz Arad and uh, Ruth Patir. Um, so I want to say a few words about the Israeli art scene as well. Uh, it is very, very vibrant. It has amazing art. And, um, and actually, it's composed of two very good international museums. One of them is the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. This is a, a show by Ulla von Brandenburg, a German artist with, uh, which I curated at the Herzliya Museum of Art. Uh, I'll just keep on rolling. And, uh, and uh, so the Tel Aviv Museum is actually more focused on contemporary art, both Israeli and international, while there is also the Israel Museum, who has various collections from uh, Judaica to pre-war to Central and South American art next to Israeli and Jewish artists, both uh, contemporary and, um, and more uh, uh, early on. Uh, this is a project uh, by Sharon Glasberg. Sharon is an Israeli artist who works more on social practice, and it was done in El Harod Museum. Uh, it was a collaborative project with the kibbutz members, both the youngers and the veterans and the elderly. Um, so on top of these two very uh, prominent international museums, we have also uh, a great number of peripheral museums like the Herzliya Museum, Petah Tikva Museum, Batyam, Chulon, eh, Umel Fachem, which most of them are dedicated to work with Israeli artists but they're also, most importantly, producing uh, works for uh, new works for Israeli artists. means that Israeli artists has a place where they can get the budget and the means to produce a new body of works and then hopefully ship it elsewhere or also create collaborations, international collaborations with museum, museums uh, abroad outside of Israel and this way to expand the visibility of their works. Um, so lastly, I want to show you also, another way of why it's not working. Woody, maybe you can uh, move to the other one. Um, so actually, you can move to Henri Salas' project now. It's a project by an Albanian-born, uh, internationally renewed artist who just had a big solo over the entire new museum at the bar in New York. So here what you can see actually the centerpiece which Henri came to Israel and spent um, more than a couple of months there. He also did a seminar with one of the art schools in Israel and he made this score uh, desig designated for this uh, space at the Helena Rubinstein Pavilion. It's actually a music score for the song uh, Should I Stay or Should I Go? But of course it also deals with dialogue under barriers. Um, so this is also a great way of creating um, collaborations with between Israel and abroad. The last project that I did was this one at the Walter Benjamin, it's called Walter Benjamin Exilic Archive. It was a group exhibition with the Walter Benjamin Archive. Walter Benjamin, as some of you know, is a very important uh, deceased Jewish philosopher who died during the Second World War when he thought the Nazis were after him. Um, his uh, writings, manuscripts, uh, collections of photographs and everything is gathered in the Kunst uh, Academy in Berlin. And I co-curated this show with Rafael Zagur and Oli. And what we did, we, worked, we showed the works of multiple artists. Half of them were from Israel, half of them were from abroad. So if you go back, uh, two slides, so you can see the work of Chaim Steinbach, he's a New York-based artist. Also, uh, Jona Friedman, he's a French-Jewish architect. Um, you can see the work of Dol Gez, 
Over there, Deor Gez is a Jewish-Palestinian artist, also the head of the photography department in Bezalel. Uh, Leonor Antunes, an artist from Portugal, and also other Israeli artists like Uri Aran and Avner Bengal and um, um, Eli Petel and Shachar Yalom as well, as you can see. So the thing was that the exhibition and the parts from Walter Benjamin's archive he chose to deal with were dealing with nomadism, uh, the revival of the Hebrew language, Zionism, and exile. So this is another way, actually, to approach uh, Jewish uh, contemporary thinking through contemporary art with the expansion of uh, and the invitation of artists from various countries to Israel and also showing next to it Israeli art. Um, so maybe uh, now I can address my first question with her. Uh, with and yeah, but thank you. Um, so dealing with all of uh, this uh, Israeli art and Israeli artists uh, concepts, I would like to ask you, Michal and uh, Nir, uh, how do you relate to this term? And if you see yourself more as an Israeli artist or a Jewish artist, and how do you negotiate these two concepts, or even if it's one for you? To be honest, like, it's, it's interesting. When I was in Israel, I all the time wanted to see myself as international, and that was my argue with this culture. Just, it's also uh, interesting. You know, when I, st when I study in Bezalel, I, gr I graduated in 93. There was not really an art scene in Israel. And I was the, like, quite like I was the youngest, actually, artist there except to Israel. Because I went to Nahal, and then, like, something happened there. Not with me. And then they said, you know, half of the people, if you find, like, a place to study or something, you can just leave the army. I didn't, and I, it's, I was one of the, all my friends start, try, some of them tried to commit even suicide to leave the army, and they said, they called my mom, they said, it's not for him, you should study art. So I was in the army for like around two years, and then I, like four months after, I started to study art. And 93, there was nothing in Israel in terms of like art, and like I was the first kind of generation that MTV started, and magazines, and it was the beginning of the beginning of Photoshop, and I argue with my, teacher and in this concept I said you know like I, st I understand art in a completely different way so I all the time try to yeah and here and there there was no internet I saw like the, f the candles paintings of uh, Gerd Richter for example I was sure that it's blurry photo I there was like uh, Jeff Koons and I said you know this is what I really want to do I didn't like all this like kind of like for me out of povera and a lot of like this Israeli culture uh, artworks he didn't really talk to me at that point. I said, you know, I want to be like, I felt like young and I want to do something like quite new. And it was different, like new language. So in Israel, I tried to be international. Then you move to New York and you are not like really, you kind of like Israeli lives in New York and you try to sell them soldiers and like stuff. And people <laughs> said to you, you know, something like, what are you doing? Or like some people, they said, yeah, this is what you should do because you're an Israeli artist. At some point, you start to like lose yourself. Like you're not really Israeli. You don't think an Israeli, and then like, but still, you are not American. Like I came to New York and I saw all these colors from Uger and Dinone, Jeff Koons, like all this yellow and pink. And I brought it to Israel. People said, "What are you doing? This is kitsch. It's ridiculous. This is not art. It's design. It's fashion. You should go to be a fashion designer." And you start to be so confused for like five years. <laughs> now you know, like you start to be like you go back to yourself. So. I always I see myself Israeli no matter what. I never dream in I never dream in English. Like I still like you know like my wife all the time said to me you have like a, such a big problem. I said what? He said because you have like two person. You have like like the artist like the Israeli artist who live in New York and you hear like you're a frustrated person who wants to go back to Israel but you cannot like leave New York. And I really like it actually. So now. Sometimes I'm like so like kind of international artist, sometimes I'm Israeli artist, but at the end, I think that at the end, the bottom line, I think that art is something so universal and something so open. And it depends what kind of artist. There are so much artists that there's so much kind of like about local culture, and some of them, they know how to translate them. I think I also you did a great translation with the Chrome works, for instance, yeah. that on one hand, it 
obviously regarding the Jewish history and the Shoah, but on the other hand, it also has strong connections to uh, the, the American post-minimalist uh, tradition, so you do navigate your... So oh, I, th that's what I want to say. So, you know, at the end, I think, like, you start to almost, like, put yourself together. And I know now how to take, like, all these, like, kind of, like, memories or, like, my, my DNA, actually, which is very Israeli, Jewish, and to translate into something universal. And I think this has become, like, some kind of benefit. And I think that it's something very important because we have some kind of like the Israeli manipulation or chutzpah. At the same time, you know how to be like very kind of like to work really hard and to be like very respect like and to now I feel like very kind of like, I feel like so great to be an artist like live in New York. And I know how to take like everything from Israel and from New York and it, it doesn't really matter for me. There was time that people said, you know, let's try to put you as like an international, like let's leave Israel. You're not an Israeli artist anymore. And I think that I will always be an Israeli artist, no matter what, and I'm proud to be uh, an Israeli artist. But I think that it's so important, and it took me a long, long time to know how to translate myself and to lose a lot of things that it was like, for us coming from Israel, it's quite obvious, and to be much more international, because I think that it's very, very important. Thank you. Wow, you care about <laughs> Why? No, no, wow. I said wow. Well, I don't know even right. why, but yes, Not and why. people who wow. know. No, yeah, I don't, <laughs> but when I'm saying I don't know why, but I guess it's like, because, you know, I'm no, trying to be true. like, compared to a lot, of, especially in art, mm -hmm. I try to be honest with myself. Oh. And it's important. You are honest. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so, Michal, maybe now we'll love to your work. So you actually work more from reality. And, and usually uh, we find in your work also a very strong Jewish uh, nomadic narrative, but also when you deal with the Israeli identity narrative, for instance, in a work like Makom, you do treat the complexities of Israel and its multi-diversified um, population. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that and also through the uh, uh, Naples project you recently installed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I feel very, very connected uh, to Israel uh, and I feel very inspired by the place, you know, the landscape. Uh, I'm rooted there, really, you know, the landscape and, the, and very much the language. Uh, so, you know, many of my works, they are titled in Hebrew still. And uh, what is Makom is, uh, I was asked, have been asked for, for a long, long time and, um, and, uh, and you know, and other uh, names. Uh, at the same time, you know, as I told you, my, my, my work is really not just about Israel and I'm, I'm really looking for for some kind of a denominator of, of a common denominator of a human experience. But I feel that living in Israel, <coughs> you do get the, you, you have some kind of an amplified, ah, we have this on the background, I yeah. see, I got it. You want to pause? So that's, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll shift, no problem. So this is a train station uh, in Napoli, and, and you know, it's a very good example actually um, to how I take something from Israel and something from another place and the experience of, of uh, you know, multi-layers of, of experience. I call this uh, walk passages. Napoli is a very chaotic city. It has a long history. It has a lot of layers of, of culture. And um, when you see this, and uh, I'll get back to it in a minute, you know, it's a very important architect, Alvaro Cesar, a very zen architect, who just made uh, a solution of black and white facing the city, Napoli, with all the, the dimensions of cultures. And I decided to call pa the walk passages. Uh, it's just between the city hall and the, municip and, and the city port and the municipality. And I, I wanted to, to touch the different layers of time that you encounter when you are in Napoli. So, and also the idea of passages, of people passing, which is what, through place, which is what people are doing in a train station. This woman who looked to everybody like the Black Maria, walking behind the tree that I painted, and the top of it is from 17th century. I filmed her from David Tower in Jerusalem, and she's actually an Islamic woman 
going to pray in uh, ma the golden mask, you know, in, on Friday. Uh, so you have an image of the children running, they are from Piazza Reale, the flowers are from Vesuvio, uh, some of the images are, uh, some of the images you saw before, they are from Pompeii, uh, so there's the old and the new together. I actually filmed Napoli and the first thing I did, as I told you, I always do, I erased the landscape of Napoli and only kept some kind of outlines, restructured the landscape. These people, everybody thought they were immigrants, but they are these immigrants coming on boats, they were the people who were going to the exhibition in the Louvre. Uh, mm -hmm. This man is walking in Piazza Reale, but you know he is doing what other elements in this project are doing, they are appearing and disappearing. And you know, you see that there is a moment where he's going to disappear suddenly. The boats were filmed in the sea, sea of Napoli, the port of Napoli, but the children were filmed in Jaffa and so was the dog Israeli. You can see how I redrew the, the lines of this landscape. And so this work is, is my fascination with, with the human traveling in time and place. And it is a great moment to throw the work out of museums into a public realm and to let anybody, you know, the CEO of a company and also the people who come to clean the place in the morning, they're all taking the metro to give something for everybody that will be kind of a democratic work, hopefully uh, read by all of them in different levels. I would like to ask uh, Doreen the last question. So Doreen, as a professional who works with different nationalities, do you, what kind of uniqueness maybe we can say different nationalities convey or are they still valid when you, you know, dealing with international art? Thanks, I think that's a great question. I think it's, I have an uh, opinion very much like Nir that you can't take the country out of the artist, or at least you can't take Israel out of the artist. And if, even if you're not necessarily dealing with political issues, you're always going to be um, Israeli. And that's amazing. I mean, that's what we, our world should be um, and should highlight and celebrate uh, different cultures. Uh, and I think that we're very fortunate to be in this time right now uh, because it used to, really Israeli art was not, was contemporary Israeli art was not out there in the contemporary art world at all until very recently when um, I would attribute a huge a part of that to our uh, organizations like Artees, um, who uh, or, started by Rivka uh, uh, Seiker, uh, amazing, amazing um, uh, endeavor. And it really cracked the door open. For 10 years ago, it was very difficult to, to have the kind of um, exposure for Israeli artists that we do. And now it's the doors open, curators are coming to Israel, b b like conceptual b barriers are being broken down and, uh, and people are understanding that Israel is a vibrant uh, culture. It's not only about kind of Israeli art, but these are very, are artists that are um, significant to the contemporary art world. So thank you. Um, thank you, Rivka. <laughs> I just wanted to add one more thing, if you don't mind, that in terms of getting involved as an Israeli in America or as a, as a Jewish person in America, it, that through art and through culture, it is a, such a win-win situation. First of all, you get to enhance your life and have these, and, and support these artists and have art in your home. Um, and at the same time, this really is a phenomenal way to support Israel, support Israeli culture, and be connected to um, our homeland. With you. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to stress out the importance of Artis as an organization who supports the Israeli art scene tremendously. And I don't think that there is no alternative uh, institution as for now, and I think Artis has made a great job in bridging out Israeli art outdoors. So yeah, definitely all the support. Thank you. Um, so maybe we'll open for questions now. Anyone has any questions? Or want to ask something? 
Yes. Yes, yeah. Uh, Toss it. <laughs> inspiration and now we're talking about whether it's Israeli inspiration or universal inspiration of what inspires an artist do you remember your answer from that no no do you I yes, don't I remember do. even the event yeah. yes actually I do and I've told it to other people who are not like me uh, uneducated people who are interested in art and you said that what really moves every artist is what moved a very early man to put his hand on a wall in a cave without an audience, without expecting to ever return to it, and that that has moved artists almost ever since. Yeah, and, and what it was, I, I now I remember what it was. I, I, I thought that, I think that what probably shocked men, mankind, men, at the very, very, very back early on is realizing, you know, here there is a life, there is a light, there is a night, there is a day, there is this, there is all these things, but suddenly realizing that it's temporary, that it ends, you know, this kind of abruptness, that things disappear on you. And, and I, I always, to me, I think that's the, that's the urge there, that you, you really want to encapsulate, you, you have the, in photography for sure, you want to capture a moment, you know it. You know that by capturing it, it's already frozen. It's already past. It already you kind of uh, constitute a past time, which is is like a, you know, is like a document of uh, of of death almost of something that is no longer uh, moving there. But you know you kind of want, and even in my work, I want this movement to go on, without a narrative, without a thing like situations, you know to be examined. But thank you, Jeff, for remembering, mm. for remembering me for so long. <laughs> I would just add that in this inauguration, you also premiered the permanent installation you have at the Light Waterfall in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, New Wing, right? Ah, yes. That was that. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Any so tell me, wha what, how different is it for you to, to move from uh, working with Israeli artists and Israeli context, and now you kind of pull yourself out and and went to New York, which is I, it's 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 tough at the beginning, I can tell you, <laughs> uh, from my own experience. And uh, I, what is your intention then to work with international artists or with Israeli art? And you know, here I'm now, interested. yes. I think I worked with international artists for a uh, couple of years now also in Israel. So also I think I'm going to continue to do the same. Uh, both? Yeah, both definitely. Primarily working with Israeli artists because, you know, it's natural for me. It, that's my home. But also working with I international artists and soon enough I will already have an exhibition by an international artist based in New York in Israel. Ah, so you work from versa. New York towards Israel or you will both. exhibit both? Yeah. I'm, I'm a sort of... A an exchange uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm sure you will do well. Thanks. She's very brilliant. Everyone <laughs> is brilliant. <laughs> Everyone is brilliant. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. More questions? No? Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. <laughs> Enjoyed your company.